Good evening, everyone. Welcome uh, for to tonight's um, episode of the California Book Club. I'm David L. Eulen, the books editor of Alta Journal. Uh, and before we get started, I'd like to introduce those of you who are unfamiliar with the book club and with the journal uh, to what we're doing. Um, Alta is a quarterly print publication um, on California culture and, and history and arts um, with an active and dedicated web presence. Um, we do weekly book reviews. We run tons of material on the California Book Club authors. California Book Club itself is a once monthly um, hour long interview with a writer um, about a particular California book focusing on the um, the power and the kind of range of the California um, canon. Um, and uh, it's, it's, it's always great to be here. So um, we're really excited about tonight's guest, Jaime, Cor Jaime Cortez, excuse me, uh, whose book Gordo, Collection of Short Stories, is the book that we will be discussing tonight. I do want to let people know that Sandra Cisneros was supposed to be here as a guest, but unfortunately, uh, something's come up at the last minute and she will be unable to attend. We'll miss her, but we have a great discussion uh, for you tonight with Jaime and, um, and John Freeman, the California. California Book Club um, host, who I'll introduce in a minute. Before we get to uh, to the to the action, I want to uh, acknowledge our partners. We couldn't do this without um, without our partners. And one of the things that's really interesting and and powerful about this is that we're really you're really seeing kind of the book community coming together um, in the service of literature, um, which is what makes this community so special. So our partners are Book Passage, Book Soup, Books Inc. Bookshop, Bookshop West Portal, Diesel, a bookstore, Green Apple Books, the Huntington USC Institute on California and the West, the Los Angeles Public Library, the San Francisco Public Library, Romans Bookstore, Narrative Magazine, and Ziziva Magazine. Um, all of these are, you know, great bookstores, great libraries, great magazines. Please. Um, avail yourself of their work. Um, so how do you support this work we're doing? Bringing, um, oh, I, for, well, I haven't done this in a while, so I've, I've left something out. Okay. It, you know, I do want to let you all know that we do um, a ton of, of coverage leading up to the events. Um, in the case of Gordo, we've got essays from numerous contributors um, and essays related to the book. We have an excerpt of Gordo. Um, we also have a review I wrote of the book last September when it came out. All of this is included in our weekly CBC newsletter, which is free, like the CBC itself, the California Book Club. So please sign up. Um, if you want to help support the work that we're doing, bringing in-depth articles, essays, and interviews with authors to you, um, it's simple. We have a sale for California Book Club members for just $50. You can get a year of Alta Journal, a California Book Club hat, and one of our upcoming California Book Club books. If you want to sign up for that, you can go to altaonline.com slash join. And you can also watch tomorrow's thank you email for a link to this great idea. Or you can also simply join Alta as a digital member for just $3 um, a month. Um, as I say, I'm a huge fan of, uh, of Jaime Cortez's book, Cordo, and I'm really looking forward to the conversation. So without any further ado, I will get out of the way and introduce Jaime and John Freeman, um, who will take it from here. Welcome, gentlemen. Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to tonight's book club. I'm so excited to talk about uh, Jaime Cortez's Gordo with Jaime himself. Uh, nice to see everyone from Alaska to Pasadena to Sacramento to Long Beach to Montana to Mexico to Peru um, and points in between. Um, about five years ago, I got an email from one of our former guests, uh, the writer Rebecca Solnit, and the title of the email which was sent on my birthday, which I thought was some sort of strange birthday present, was this is one of my favorite things I've ever read. And attached in there was a short story um, by Jaime Cortez. And Rebecca, in her typical um, wonderful fashion, said, Jaime was meant by God to be a writer. Um, I am his <laughs> nag and his pimp. Uh, and that's how I met Jaime Cortez uh, in a story called The Nasty Book Wars, which was in is included in this book. Um, which is a series of stories set in the 1970s in and around Watsonville, California, um, around uh, a migrant workers camp. There are 11 stories linked around the life, mostly uh, uh, of a slightly husky um, 
slightly femme boy growing up named Gordo is his nickname. Um, and we follow Gordo through his coming of age in this world, but we also meet a lot of other people, his friend, Fat Cookie. Uh, we meet a hairdresser later on named Romundo. We meet his next door neighbor, Alex, um, who Jaime will read about tonight. I think the easy way to describe this book would be a, a kind of revision of Steinbeck country, but that underestimates how wonderful this book is, how funny the kind of psychogeography of the place that it creates in its simple sentences and its beautiful riffs about how people live around each other violently with humor, with tenderness, with grace, with curiosity. I think it's a magical book that could probably reach millions uh, in the end um, because it's written with such clear heart uh, and also just a, an immense kind of craft that lures us into very complex uh, territory by giving us stories that feel warm to the touch that invites you in. Jaime is that kind of person you'll see very quickly. He worked as a HIV prevention activist. Uh, he's worked as a performer, probably several other jobs he might get into tonight. Um, he's mysterious and wonderful. He's sitting in front of some very interesting art, which may or may not be his. Um, and he's also drawn um, his own art in the past and written um, a graphic novel called Sexile, uh, which we'll get into. Um, but let's get him out of exile in the Zoom room and bring him in. This is Jaime Cortez, one of my favorite people in the world. It's such a pleasure to have you here with Gordo uh, tonight for the California Book Club. Hello, everybody, and good evening to you all. I'm so excited to to be here with the California Book Club. It's such an honor. And uh, I just I'm really been looking forward to this discussion and to uh, having some time to share with you all for, for many weeks. I've been looking forward to this, so it's good to be here. Thank you for having me. I'm going to resist the obvious question, which is ask you about the art behind you, um, but get into it maybe in a second, because I, I do want to start with Sexile, which is this graphic novel, really completely different style, um, different setting. Um, you would you would almost never know that the person who, who who worked on and made that book wrote these stories. So I I wonder if, wonder if you can talk to us about the genesis of this book, where these stories started to come come out, and how you decided on because it feels very deliberate. You, you decided on the style in which you would tell some of these stories. Um, and you're referring to the stories in in Gordo, yes? Yes. Okay, great. Um, you know, they they came out of I think a couple of things. Obviously, the the book is not obviously, but the book is a, a work of semi autobiographical fiction. But it's really more than semi. It's heavily heavily autobiographical. And Gordo is very much my earthly representative in this narrative. Uh, that that child is is very much me. Um, I think it was a couple of things that was interesting to me. One is that um, I, I wanted to see more stories about people like this. Uh, so I was I was anxious to to have these stories be out in the world and to tell these stories of of that California that I grew up in, that California of farm workers, of people kind of on the underside of the economy, on the underside of legality. Some of them are undocumented, um, and uh, and that was something that kind of drove me. Uh, and I think equally importantly for me, I was really interested in trying to communicate the kind of sensibility that that the people I grew up with had, the the way that they loved, the way that they joked, the way that they hurt. Uh, uh, I, I was just really wanting to communicate this this sensibility of a, of a, of a, this community of people, my family members and and other people on the migrant farm worker camp uh, and and, uh, and how we were together. So those two things were really strong motivators. So did you did you grow up in a camp like the one in Gordo? And I, if so, I wonder what your earliest memories of it were. Uh, I did grow up on farm worker camps, uh, specifically in San Juan Bautista, which is really uh, nearby to Watsonville here, for those of you who know this geography of uh, uh, of, of, of Monterey, Santa Cruz, San Benito counties. Um, so I, I did grow up in that, in that setting. And, and what was the second part of your question? It was, what was it? 
Um, just can you talk a little bit what it, what it was like to grow up there? Oh yeah, like for me, it was uh, you know looking back on it now, uh, it, in in so many ways. Now that I think about it, it was like growing up in a Mexican village surrounded on all sides by California. That's the way I kind of describe this place. Uh, everybody was either uh, immigrant or first generation American children of immigrants. Uh, everybody kind of spoke Spanish. The kids, uh, a lot of the kids could speak English as well, but mostly Spanish was the, the language of that little, that, of that little village uh, uh, of the, of, that was the farm worker camp. Um, it was a place that was, uh, uh, it, it was in a small town, like San Juan Bautista is, remains a tiny town, uh, but I, I think the, the thing that was to me was so striking was going back there as an adult and realizing that the distance between the camps and downtown San Juan, the, the two or three blocks of kind of uh, stores and other bakeries and all that stuff, you know, the actual distance is probably not even two to three miles, but it might as well have been another country because it just felt like you were crossing into a whole different country when to me, it felt like we were crossing into a different country when we went from this camp to the land of homes with driveways and front yards uh, and indoor toilets, you know, all of that seemed to me like exotic and of another world. Uh, I think I think that's something that really kind of jumps out at me when I think back at those camps. Um, I did not initially realize that we were poor. It, it, it wasn't until I started going to school that I realized, oh, we, we are poor people. Uh, and uh, so that was, uh, uh, for me, it was just everybody around me was kind of in that kind of socioeconomic bracket of farm workers and their children. So there was nothing else for me to compare it to. That sense of um, being set off aside from California exists in the book in this, this really wonderful way of this deep enclosure, this sort of almost sense of protection. In the first story, this guy who comes in with a bakery truck with a, selling donuts for 10, 10 cents each, but two for 25, which is a weird deal because you think, uh, I think that's how I remember it. I think it was 12 cents each, two for 20. Yeah, yeah, okay, so that is a deal. Uh, and and the kids kind of look at him like this stranger, this sort of, it, it's you know almost like the beginning of a kind of adventure film where this guy rolls up out of nowhere with his, and he's probably just driven in from another part of town and the kids all, he tries to speak to them very slowly in Spanish and they're like, no, we speak English. Yeah. And throughout the book, I, I feel like you very gently, keep, at least into the sort of latter parts, the world enclosed. And I, I wonder what that enclosure allows you to do and what to not do as a storyteller in terms of how you treat and look at and present your characters. Yeah, I was very much interested in the interrelatedness of adults and children on this camp. And so occasionally that 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 little village, as I call it, would be the, the, the bubble of that village would be pierced by somebody from the outside. Uh, and it was always an, it's always an event. It's noteworthy when someone from the outside would come to the camps. So that was something that was compelling for me. It also, you know, um, a lot of the stories are about the society that children make in the absence of adults. Uh, and I think that having them on this farm worker camp and having that kind of isolation, uh, it's kind of a perfect petri dish for that, you know, for that experiment of like, what do kids do when you leave them on their own? Uh, and so, and I think, and I think that the the kind of isolation of the camp also helped me to get to those kinds of things because they 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 had each other there, whoever else was in the camp, and there was not much else from the outside, so they have to contend with each other, and that's the the beauty and at times the challenge of like very small town life or village life or in this case the life of a camp, um, is that you have this intimacy, you have to contend with each other. Mm. Yeah, and I think kids have an innate sense of fairness and unfairness. Um, they're always up to mischief. Um, they're trying on selves and ideas, and they react very viscerally to presentational modes of being, which is quite funny because throughout this book, especially in the first half, Gordo's often getting messages either by watching or by being presented with them 
um, of how he's supposed to be as a boy or as a man, which is absurd because he's a boy. And and so in the in the second story, his his father brings him uh, a wrestler's outfit um, to sort of treat, <laughs> ask him to sort of be a man. But he's presented him with some the most incredible camp outfit a, a boy could possibly be presented with. And I I wonder if you could read from that story because it's a perfect example of of the kind of collision of adult and kid world. Yeah, so uh, that's great. That's a good introduction to it. It does take the story does take place on the former for camp and. Uh, the, the, the Gorbo father had, has gone out as he always does on Sunday to the flea market and he came back with all this boxing and wrestling gear for Gordo, which was like a gift from another planet. It was so alien to who Gordo really was, but it was so much about, you know, fathers, you know, the father wanting him to be this kind of boy. So I'll just do a brief, maybe five minute uh, reading from that. Um, so the, the father bought a box and they begin unpacking it and taking out all this boxing gear. And then Gordo starts asking his father questions. Where did you get all this boxing stuff? I asked Pa. At the Pulga, of course, the Arabes. They're having new things for the boys today. Boxing, lucha libre, wrestling things. People were buying it like pan caliente. Look in the box, hijo, there's more. Inside the big box, there's a smaller box. I open it up. Shiny white boxer boots with silver stripes and shoelaces and little dangly pom-poms on the side. Thank you, I say. These are so pretty. Bug is real quiet. He opens his mouth like he's going to say something. But he don't say nothing. He shakes his head like, Something bad just happened. I'm holding my boots like little twin babies. I'm telling him they're so pretty. And then he breathes like he's really tired. And he says, keep going, hijo. I reach into the box and grab a folded up bag and open it up. Yes, a lucha libre mask of my favorite wrestler, El Santo. The mask covers your whole head and face in sparkly silver. Even the mouth holes and the eye holes are sparkly. It's all for you, hijo. Keep going, he says. There's a bag in the box. I open it up. A jump rope. Wow, pa, this is the best thing. I feel like maybe I'm going to cry. I look up at pa. I almost can't say it. But finally, I say, gracias, papi. I've been wanting my own jump rope forever. Sylvie never lets me loans mean hers to me. But now, anytime I want to, I can play jump rope. It's not for playing, says Ba. It's for ejercicio. Understand? You start training and training so your heart and your legs can get fuerte and you can burn off the fat, get strong to do boxing, lucha libre, entiendes? I understand, Pa. Hijo, you know how Muhammad Ali is the black Superman? Yeah, he's the best. Well, Gordo, you can be the brown Superman. Float like a butterfly, sting like a bee. Un gran campeón. <coughs> okay. All you need to do is train hard. You want to put on the Santo mask? Yeah, Pa. I grab it and try to put it on, but I can't. Ba takes it from me and unties the laces on the back of the mask and opens it up. Then he puts it on my head, pulls it down hard. I can feel him tying the laces in the back. When he finishes, it's really tight. It's pulling my hair. My ears kind of bent. It hurts, but I don't care. I love it. Turn around, Gordo says, Pa, look at yourself. I walk over to the mirror. Wow. I'm pretty sure I look cool. My boss stands behind me. I hold up my arms and make a muscle. Then he reaches down and tries to pull off my shirt. I don't want to take off my shirt in front of him or nobody. I grab it and yank it back down. Gordo, he says, take it off. I don't want to take it off now. With my shirt off, I feel naked. I don't like it. He tells me to look in the mirror again, so I do. I look even more like El Santo now. He's smiling. I feel like El Santo. This is boss. 
Let's go outside so I can teach you jumping the rope, says Pa. I already know how to jump rope, Pa, I say. When I play with Sylvia and the girls, I can beat him sometimes. I grab my rope and follow him. I don't ever go outside with my shirt off, even at the beach. It's embarrassing to be fat. I don't like the way people look at me, but today I don't care. I'm in Santo, I'm the best. I pick a spot in front of the house and I begin jumping rope. My father looks pretty excited when he sees me jump. My dog Lobo comes running to see what's going on. Caramba, gordo, you got good reflexes, mijo. Good feet. I never seen my father so happy before. And I started to jump faster and faster. And when the rope hits the ground, little rocks and dust pop right up. My papi's watching me. He's laughing. He's so excited. He even jumps up and down a few times. Lobo is excited too. His tail is wagging. He starts barking. I start to sing my favorite jump rope song that I learned from Sylvie. I'm a little princess dressed in blue. Here are the things I like to do. Salute to the captain, bow to the queen. Turn my back on the submarine. Don't, he yells. Don't what, I ask. Don't sing that song. I'm breathing hard from the jumping, but I'm also thinking hard. I look at his face. If the next thing I say is the wrong thing, I'm going to get hit. Should I sing a different song, I ask? No, hijo, no singing. All you do is jump and count, jump and count, okay? Every day you're training. You're trying to jump a little more. Okay, I say, I'll count. So that was an excerpt from the story El Gordo. Oh, I love hearing you read, Jaime. Um, you're such a great reader. And I love in that scene how um, there's there are two people in it, but one of them is wearing a mask and it's not necessarily Gordo. You know, it's it's like he's responding to honestly to the messages that he's being being given. And while you were reading uh, Linda Lucero, one of the audience members had a really good question, which is, can, can you talk a bit about how you found the right voice for these characters who are not yet adults? Because I think that's one of the great strengths of these these stories. If if I had to identify what the core project was in the end of doing this collection, it was nailing that kid voice. That's where I ended up having to put a lot of energy. Um, and um, my process involved uh, First of all, a lot of reading it out loud. I have to hear it in my ears to know if it sounds quote right, whatever that means. And that you know, that's a, the calculus for that is a nuanced one that it's very individual to me. Uh, what I think of as being the right thing, the true, the thing that feels true to these kids. And I think the other really important task was figuring out how to evacuate my adult mind and my adult language and frameworks out of this kid, get the adult self out. Uh, and instead try to remember back to the poetics of children uh, and to remember that, you know, there is such a thing as a philosopher kid, like they philosophize in their own ways with their own language, with their own frameworks. And that was the work for that, for that voice. Uh, and it was a, a wonderful exercise and it, uh, I, I'm really glad that I realized after a while that I, I had to get my adult self out of that, out, out of that voice. Well, and, and one other tiny detail that I, I think you get down very cold is that for kids, a dog is like another person. And so <laughs> Lobo's activities, uh, you know, there's one of my favorite sentences in the book is, you know, the dogs are melting, <laughs> you know, and, and the, the, Dogs are just sort of part of the pack of, of kids growing up. The, another question that came up from the audience um, in, in advance of the event, which I think is also related to what we're talking about in terms of voice and seeing kids with, with their own terms with complexity and creating a voice for that in stories um, is someone is, is to ask how much of this is influenced by comics, which is a great form in which those things can be worked out. and. 
someone in particular wanted to know whether Gordo was inspired by a cartoon character called Gordo created by Gus uh, Ariola. Um, no, it, it, this Gordo was not inspired by that Gordo. Uh, although I, I am I'm fond of, of Gus Ariola's uh, Gordo indeed. Um, I, I would say that um, this wasn't, uh, this was, I think the connection that I would make to comics is that I try to write very concretely and very visually. Uh, to So um, I, I often say, you know, I love drawing and I, and I love uh, writing as well. And I often say that, you know, when I, when I draw, I draw stories. And when I write, I write pictures. So I try to be really concrete. Uh, and I would say that for me, the experience of writing the stories is very much like a, a movie or like storyboarding. Um, mm -hmm. It's just, I just think about what do people do? What do people say? I don't spend much time at all inside the heads of any of these characters. It's really, everything's coming from their words and their actions. Mm -hmm. um, so, so I'm focused on that, the very concrete and the very external. Yeah. As this book goes on, though, Gordo becomes more of a participant observer in a way. I mean, he's talking the whole time. Um, but in in um, in Chorizo, for example, you know, when this family comes to town, this Indio family, he's doing a lot of observing about how his family deals with the need to be the, the, the challenge to be generous, you know, to, to not judge and he sort of observes this exchange. And I, I wonder if you can talk about the difference between sort of the first couple stories. Um, and I guess in, in some ways, the cookie story is one where he's observing, but as he goes on, as the book goes on, he, he is sort of watching and learning and we're not, he's not summarizing what he's learning, but somehow the stories tell us what he's registering. And I wonder if you can talk about that kind of process yeah, you know, uh, in those stories, um, I, I really see Gordo, um, you know, a little kid finding the world rather mysterious. Like, why do people do this? How did this family arrive at the migrant farm worker camp with nothing but a few bags of clothes uh, that they carry on their backs? You know, he's all of these things feel kind of like a, there's a kind of a the mystery of the world and he's he's like a little detective using what he has to try to uh make meaning out of that uh and so he he needs to be observant in order to uh to just kind of unravel these these mysteries because it's not the kind of world where he can ask where he does ask for explanations of why is it like this why do people do that why do people end up in those circumstances there's not that kind of facile um, communication, uh, which I think is a great thing for kids to have if they, when they're growing up is to be able to just ask. But Gordo is not in a world of just ask. He's more in the world of shut up, you're a little kid, shut up. Uh, and if you wanna figure something out, you, you need to listen and try to make meaning. So, so I, think it's, I think it has to do with that. You've had some experience working in a kind of listening capacity to some degree as, as a HIV prevention and AIDS activist and counselor to some degree. I, I might be misrepresenting some of that work, but I, I wonder if you can talk about the way that you grew up in, in, the, in the place that you grew up and, and what it taught you, if anything, about how to, to listen to people and how to attend to what they are presenting you with and what they're telling you. And how that sat with you as a person, not, not necessarily just an artist, but as a person moving into a world in the 80s and 90s that had some severe challenges. And when the kind of activist in you woke up and what it thought about listening as an activist capacity. I'd say a couple of things. Um... One is that, you know, when I think about uh, the years that I was involved in HIV, it was mostly on a on a volunteer basis, just volunteering to try to be helpful. Um, there's a way that that can be very adjacent to activism, but I think it's not quite the same thing because it wasn't uh, an act about agitating for change. It was trying to help within the systems that already exist. So uh, I, I would be hesitant to call myself uh, 
an HIV activist, but I was a volunteer and I was engaged uh, for those for those years that I was in that. Sometimes that can feel like activism, but there's a little bit of a different nuance. Um, I think uh, the listening thing is is a really interesting one to me, uh, John. There's, I think the most primordial thing I could say about the listening piece is um, a child growing up in a world where there's alcohol and violence uh, has to learn to be very observant and has to know how to read the room because that, for me anyways, that kind of violence or shouting could erupt at any moment. So you had to be able to, to know how to navigate that and how to not do things that might set it off. Uh, and so the listening piece and, and being observant was a kind of survival mechanism. Um, you, you have to learn how to navigate these, these gross power imbalances and the hovering uh, possibility of violence that's always there. Um, so I think that was very informing to me in terms of listening and observing and trying to understand what makes people tick and what do they want and need. Uh, and how much can they be trusted? Uh, so all of that is is uh, is is kind of in play. I don't know if that answers your question, but that's a beginning. Oh, absolutely. I, I mean, I grew up in the era where kids were hit, <laughs> so yeah. you know. And I I was I was always as a kid reading the room, you know, making sure that I didn't get too close to the edge where, you know, I was going to get hit in the head. Yes. And, <laughs> when we, I, I was just remembering something very recently that I'd completely forgotten was that when I was first in elementary school, um, um, there was like this hierarchy because some kids' parents had signed the form that said, yeah, you can hit my kid. And some kids' parents had signed the form that said, no, you can't hit my kid. And so there was like this thing and we had like a lot of curiosity of like, are you exempt from being, you know, hit by, at school or not? Uh, so I, I just, I had forgotten all about that. It was, it was, we were in a funny transition between the culture of corporal punishment and the emerging culture of that, that, that corporal punishment in school was unacceptable. Yeah, it's, it, I had, a, we won't go down this road, I promise, but I, there was a, a third grade teacher with a paddle with holes in it because the holes made it hurt more. You know, you would think that this was, you know, 1919, but it was actually the 1970s, you know, and that, that was, I dreaded, you know, going to third grade for that reason. And I guess one thing I want to ask you about is, you know, it, typically when violence occurs in fiction, it, it can kind of clear the room, it can kind of flatten. And throughout this book, there you have these moments where violence happens, either person to person, uh, or, or there's a fight, um, or men dancing suddenly get into a fight because they're trying to figure out who's the best dancer. And then suddenly, you know, at the very end of a fight, there's an act of tenderness. Uh, I guess what I'm trying to work towards is that you you capture the, the suddenness and then the fact that it's over and that there couldn't be right after that a swerve towards tenderness. And I guess what, what I wanna ask you about is how knowing how violence can feel when you're in it, how you were able to keep the story supple enough so that the violence didn't overwhelm it. Because I, I think it would, a book like this, because there are some really hard things in it, could have been overwhelmed by the acts of violence that occur within it. Yeah, you know, um, I, I think that um, uh, I knew that 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 my stories um, were right next door to abjectness. Like I, I knew that um, because you have this combination of poverty and marginalization and violence and you know queerness. It, it's just right next door to abjectness, and I didn't want to be in that place. I, I wanted to ho hopefully you know uncover some of these tremendous challenges and frightening things that were part of this, this world that this child lived in. Uh, but I didn't want that to be so defining. And so I had to figure out, like, it's like a recipe, like just how much of this abjectness can we include without it becoming abject? You know, like how much salt can you put in the soup before it actually becomes too salty? It's, it's kind of like that um, feeling, I think. Uh, and, um, I needed to do that because uh, 
these characters are pretty much all based on actual people or composites of people that I actually knew growing up, including a lot of family members. And I love them. And I don't want to flatten them into just uh, perpetrators of violence or victims of violence. Uh, life's much more complex than that. Uh, it's much more poignant than that to me. People are many things. Um, and so and so that was, I think, how I was thinking about uh, the function of violence and how to fold that violence into these stories. There's, it allows you this um, unwillingness to flatten and your attendance to roundedness in characters. You're one of the best character writers I know in, in California writing for sure, uh, is you, you have this ability to um, have stories have many alt uh, um, dimensions. So the Nasty Book War is the story uh, which I talked about at the beginning of the hour, is so many things. It's a coming of age story. It's a satire of sexual coming of age. It's kind of a meditation on the kind of normalization of sexual violence. These kids are basically learning how to be gendered sexual kids through nudie magazines, which are frankly qu quite gross, <laughs> that they then fight over and tear up into bits. In the middle of this, it's this amazing juxtaposed portrait of the adults having parties. You have all these wonderful nicknames for the characters, preemie, head and shoulders, who has no neck, you know, and in the middle of all of this, there's also a, 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 a raid from, you know, ice or the equivalent thereof then. Yeah. It's, it's, it's somehow overshadowed by the nasty book wars, <laughs> which is which is why when I read this story the first time, I thought, oh, my God, I have to publish this guy in the in Freeman's. Um, so I, I guess I want to figure out for, um, from you because we're, we're getting in towards the middle of the hour and I'd love you to read again is is as you get to the middle to the two thirds point of this book, the stories get very complex and, and the worlds that they're juxtaposing especially in Nasty Book Wars and especially in Alex. Um, and what did you change in how you were writing those stories to, to sort of tilt them towards uh, a, a greater contextual con complexity? Yeah, you know, the, the these stories in this book were written over a, a long period of time, a couple of decades, really. Uh, and some of them were, uh, most of the newer ones, I really focused on trying to get that Gordo kid voice but some of the early, earlier stories that involved uh, Gordo are not told from his voice. And the Nasty Book Wars is a, an adult kind of narrator uh, telling that story. And so you get to bring that kind of adult uh, sophistication uh, to you know, how you tell the story of these kids you know, discovering this pornography, which, um, and uh, you know, I've, after having the book out for more than a year, I finally started getting invitations from high schools to come and present in high school settings. And one of the things that comes up, that story will sometimes come up, and I always make a point of reminding these kids, like, okay, you guys, if you have internet access, you have access to oceans of pornography, like every possible permutation from every corner of the world. It's all there for you to ogle and be fascinated by. And I just need you to cast your mind back to a time when it was actually quite unusual to have access uh, to porno if you were a kid and what it would mean to find this stash, this hoard of, of pornography. <laughs> so I kind of take him back to that. Um, um, and, um, and I'm sorry, I lost track of the question. Oh, I, was, I guess I was asking, um, and you've sort of answered it, which is how you tilt these stories towards greater complexity in the middle of the book. Oh, and yeah, yeah. Sort of answer so that by having an adult it's that, narrator. It's that, it's that voice switch, switching from the kid voice to an adult narrator that allows you to have this different kind of penetration that's not just based on what you are observing, but mm -hmm. it's combining what you are observing and connecting it to a bigger picture, bigger set of facts, mm -hmm. um, which is the difference between that kid voice and that adult narrator. Um, um, I, you mentioned high schools, and if there's any educators who are listening to this call, I cannot recommend enough that you invite Jaime to come talk. I've seen you read in person, Jaime, a few times, and every time you sort of bring the house down. Once you even overshadowed Rebecca Solnit, which I think is virtually impossible to do, but when you read at City Lights, everyone was like, who, who is this guy? I have to get this book. 
that was a year or two before your your book was even out. Um, I, I, I want to move back to the book though, because you know, at this, the heart of this book is a, is a long story called Alex, which I think is just a masterpiece, and it does return you to um, Cordo's voice, but it's a different kind of depth to the voice. He's observing. There's this person that lives next door named Alex, and I, I wonder if you could take over the description of the story because I think you handle so many of the details in it with with just absolute mastery. Um, I think uh, in, in this story, um, Gordo and his family have left the farm workers camp and they've moved into their own home. Uh, and they have a neighbor. Uh, and um, the story is really about Gordo learning that things are not always what they seem. Uh, and, and beginning to understand some of the inner workings of what was happening next door with, with his neighbors. Uh, and uh, of a kind of abuse situation that was happening that kind of echoes abuse that had happened in Gordo's own family. But it had all these other elements that were really confounding to Gordo uh, to see, to begin to realize, whoa, there's something going on next door that I had no idea about. And I'm just trying to piece it together and I don't quite get it. Um, and so, um, so the in this scene, I'm going to read from uh, Gordo, um, Gordo's neighbor, uh, Delia, who is the woman who lives next door, uh, she's reaching out to him uh, across the fence. There's a fence that's covered with ivy uh, and it has holes in it and, uh, and that separates the two properties. And so they're having this communication across this ivy fence. Uh, and I want to uh, read uh, uh, from, from uh, again, another like five minutes or so from there. Uh, and so this is Gordo's talking about the couple that lives next door. If you saw them all dressed up in Easter colors on Sunday, you probably think they look pretty happy. But I know they're not because sometimes I hear the bad sounds coming from their house. I know the bad sounds from when Ba returns, returns home drunk and angry. From Alex's house, I hear shouting, things breaking, scared screams somebody making noises like an angry animal. I once heard Delia begging Alex not to hit her, but of course she didn't stop hitting. It never works when you ask someone to stop hitting you. A few weeks later, I'm hanging clothes on the clothesline and I hear my name. It's soft at first, so I don't really notice it, but it gets louder. Gordo. Gordo, Gordo, I can't figure out where the voice is coming from till I notice it's coming from the ivy fence between our house and Alex's. It's me, Delia, says the ivy. Hi, Delia, I didn't see you. Gordo, I'm wondering, do you know how to fix this? I hear the sounds of ivy leaves and vines getting pushed aside. Then I see Delia's hand holding a transistor radio with a suitcase handle on top. She pushes it through a hole in the fence over to our side. I walk towards the hand and take the radio. Your radio's broken, I ask? Yes. No, I, I don't know, maybe. I take the radio from her hand. Turn it on, says Delia. I find the on off button and push it. The radio starts playing when I need you. I change the station. It's Cornelia Reina's Barrio Pobre. I change it again. It's a football game. Boring. I change it one more time and it's rock the boat. That's my jam. I turn up the volume. It sounds good. Your radio sounds okay to me, Delia. I know the sound is good, but it's broken. It's, it's different. I bought this radio from El Salvador. I wanted to know what was happening back in my country. But when I turn it on here, it mostly talks in English. I can't hear the radio voices from home. I turn the dial to where the news should be. And all I hear is rock and roll in English. What happened to the voices from home? I'm not sure how to explain it, but I try. The, the radio is different in every place, I say. When we go visit family in San Jose, 
The radio is different, different music, different news. You can't hear the voices from back home in your country. They're too far away. Oh, says Delia. I can tell from her all oh, that this is bad news. I really wanted to hear the voices from home, says Delia. I miss them so much. It makes me feel lonely. I thought the voices from home lived inside the radio and I could bring them to Watsonville. You can't, Delia. I'm so stupid. I'm a burra. No, you're not stupid, Delia. You just didn't know how the radio works. Here, let me give you back your radio. Delia pushes back some ivy like a curtain on her end. Through the hole, I see a corner of her face. She has a puffy eye. It's black with purple. I don't say nothing. I push the radio through the ivy and she takes it. Thanks, Gordo, she says. She sounds so sad. I hear her walking away. I hear her back door open and then shut. I finish hanging the clothes. I'm not sure what to do. Ma's always telling me to mind my own business. Says I'm like some nosy old lady. Black eyes are top secret. Two times Ma got a black eye from Pa, but nobody said nothing about it. I guess you're supposed to shut up like nothing happened. Swallow the story. But Delia needs help. So what should I do? I look up to the sky, close my eyes, and I ask God to tell me what to do. I wait and wait, hanging closed. He don't say nothing. Every time I ask for help, he never says nothing. I finish hanging the clothes and I go back into the house. Sylvie's doing homework at the kitchen table. Ma's cleaning the living room windows. I open my soft drawer and grab my magic eight ball. I know it's stupid to ask a toy what to do, but I'm stuck. I hold the black ball close to my mouth and I whisper, should I tell Ma about Delia's black eye? I shake the ball and stare at the little round window with the blue water. My answer floats up to the window. Ask again later, stupid ball. I shake the ball hard and ask again. Signs point to yes, says the ball. Okay, that's it. I decided I'm gonna tell. So that was a little excerpt from Alex. Oh, I love that story. And it's just the first question of many he has to sort of ask himself um, because once he decides to do something, decides to tell a series of revelations begin. And I, we're sort of running a little bit tight on time and I don't want to reveal what those revelations are, but it definitely opens up a world of, uh, of complexity towards him, for him, about people not being what they appear to be and abuse not coming from the expected directions all the time, so to speak. Yeah. I, I want to go to a question from the audience named uh, from someone named Patricia Grogan, because as you were reading, you know, you talked about storyboarding your stories. You can see it so vi vi uh, visually. You can see the fence. You can see them talking through it. You could almost see this as a film or, or, or a, a, a scene within a play. And Patricia Grogan asked, or is there any ch chance of a collaboration with El Teatro in San Juan to present Gordo? Um, you know, this is a wonderful theater company. And um, I have a complicated situation with them because I work at the Hewlett Foundation and we're arts funders. And Teatro Campesino is one of my grantees. So <laughs> as the funder, it would be totally not cool if my play got presented at their theater because that's just looks so much like conflict of interest. And it probably and it is. So it wouldn't be there, but hopefully uh, another place that's not a grantee of mine might pick it up at some point. We'll see. Uh, Mar Marsha Peralta asks, is this an audio book and did you narrate it? Um, it is an audiobook, and uh, the uh, Penguin uh, had, did not want me to read the book. Uh, and I tried to, to convince them to let me do it, but they want professional uh, professionals to do it. And the person they chose did a, a really good job. He's, a, he's all pro. Uh, I remain a bit heartbroken about that because that book 
came to me in my spoken voice. As, as I mentioned, I always read my work out loud to myself. And in my mind, it only exists in my voice. Uh, and they chose someone very capable, but it's not me. And I think it's always going to be a little bit heartbreaking that, that it played out that way. You you have a lot of um, talents in various art forms. You, you've you worked in, as a graphic novelist. You've put together anthologies. Uh, you've helped writers as a, as a grant giver at the Hewlett foundation um obviously seeing you tonight it's so clear that you you're also a performer of sorts um which leads me to wonder just as a sidebar uh, what the art is behind you <laughs> and if it's uh -huh. yours or someone else's and and how your visual aesthetic overlaps with or doesn't with your your narrative aesthetic okay yeah i could talk about this um uh, <laughs> and uh this one here uh, on this corner, uh, this is a painting by the late and very lovely Tony DiCarlo, uh, and who was at the time based in Los Angeles. And uh, Tony did these wonderful paintings of Latino men that was that tended to be his his subject matter. And I always was very taken with that work and continue to be taken with it. Um, this middle piece, uh, which I should just let me see if I can adjust the camera a little bit. Yeah, there we go. Um, this middle piece uh, is an acrylic uh, painting uh, by Orlando Garza. It's a San Francisco artist. Uh, and I had seen um, uh, another of his paintings in a similar kind of vein with, the, with, this, with, this, with this man wearing a santo mask. This is actually the wrestler ring question in the story. This is a santo mask. This is the look of it. Except in this case, he turns it into a disco ball instead of just silver fabric. Uh, and I was just really smitten with it. And uh, I asked him if he could do another version of it for me, and I did. So this was my first ever commissioned uh, painting that I purchased on layaway. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I'm so glad I did. Uh, and then the third one uh, is uh, Jamie Chavez. Um, and he's based in Los Angeles. And he does these beautiful, super graphic, super flat images combining like LA homies with with kind of Aztec or Mayan elements. Uh, in this case, uh, the, the homie is wearing like this kind of headdress, uh, which I am a, a bit ignorant and I don't know if this one would be Mayan or Aztec, but it's one of those I'm guessing. Mm. Uh, and that's the theme he kind of likes to work with and I adore his work. It's just so flat and elegant. Oh, that's wonderful. Do you ever, when you go to talk to, to high schoolers or young kids um, about writing, about Gordo, about being being a, an artist, do you ever bring visual art as you as you do readings? Or, or do you just basically allow your voice to fill the room? I have not begun doing that. I can somebody asked about this 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 last piece. Well, let me get it closer. They said they couldn't see it. Uh, so let me just grab it here. Um, and this might give you a better picture of it. It's on, uh, it's on wood, which I really love. I love painting on plain old uh, wood. And that's that's it. So, anyways, um, uh, but no, I, I have not incorporated the visual art into school presentations that I do. Um, going back to sort of the story you just read, Alex, uh, I feel like that would be such a great story for for high schoolers to read for all sorts of reasons, because it's such a um, a generous and enlarging entry point for issues of gender, uh, of neighborliness, of what to do when you see something you know is wrong, um, about assumptions, um, about same sex relationships, all kinds of things. Um, and I don't know what it is about this book, but I. I it makes, and I know it's not me because one of the interviews that ran of you was in, in a Monterey publication was just said, the wisdom of Jaime Cortez, <laughs> which you can be forgiven for developing a slightly big head if people start asking you things like that. But I do think this book pervades, it, it carries wisdom in the lightest way. And it does that by allowing a child to have wisdom. And I guess what I'm building towards is a question that one of the audience members, Gabrielle Bernal, asked, which is, this is one of my favorite books that I shared with friends and family, Gabrielle writes. I'm curious what insights that you now know 
that you would share with Gordo or any of the other kids as a Tio or as an older sibling? Can you, uh, can you say that again, please? I think the question is, you know, we were in this book, we're watching Gordo learn some things, yeah. you know, expensively in a way, emotionally, experientially. And of course, as the book goes on, we kind of leave the kid world and, and we meet Raimundo, Raimundo, who's, who's sort of more closer to a, an adult eventually, um, is an adult. But, you know, you, you don't sort of reflect back on this world with adult knowledge per se except in, in nasty book wars which is narrated from adult perspective and i i guess the question that gabriel bernal is asking is what insights would you share with gordo or with any other kids of that age that that you now know yourself either um, as a writer or as a teal or an older sibling um i think there's a couple of things you know i, I think about that that little fat sissy boy um and uh, I, you know you, there's I think for anybody just to go back and find the pictures of yourself as a kid and just take a really, really good look. And it really opens up your heart um, to yourself, but also just to, to kids in general. Um, I, I certainly found that to be a case. Just, you know, pictures I'd seen a thousand times just to sit and look really, really closely uh, was a fantastic exercise. Um, and um, I suppose if, if I had to say things, uh, to, to a kid like that. One of them is um, you get to be yourself. You get to be yourself. Uh, and sometimes that comes, you know, at a price, but you get to be yourself. And I think that was something that was so unfathomable to that little, to that little boy version of me was to imagine that you can just be who you are. You can be the, the sissy, you can be the queer kid, you can be, you know, the the kind of bookworm one in a world where bookworm being a bookworm was not very valued. Uh, you can be those things. Um, I think it's just that it's a very simple message, I think. Do you feel that way as a as a writer now as an adult? I mean, the last time I saw you, we went to City Lights and had an event and after, you bought about seven books. Uh, and we went, <laughs> we talked afterwards and it was very clear that like you have peopled your life full of books and cartoons and art and good friendships and um, you've lived a life of being a, a sort of out man. And, and I wonder if, if, if that is part of your feeling that you're talking about now, looking back to kids or your older, your younger self, that that maybe you got to become yourself. Um, and I guess the, the question I asked then is, is um, for, for kids who are in situations where they're not allowed to be themselves or feel like they can't be themselves, what do you say other than wait? <laughs> you know, or do you hope that a book like this allows them in some way to be themselves, at least on the page or while they're listening or reading it? I think that um, one of the things like for, for kids and for young people is if, the, if there is hostility, if they feel that there is hostility or actually danger in being themselves, they have to find the places where they can do, where they can uh, express that. Um, and it can be, you know, in the company of certain friends, trusted friends, that's a place. Um, I remember being adolescent and a friend started basically explaining to me that that he was gay. Uh, and that was revelatory, that someone else was experiencing that and that they would actually share it. I didn't feel comfortable sharing that about myself yet, but it meant the world to me that someone kind of could share that, you know, knowing probably very clearly that I was also a, a gay kid. Um, so so there's that. It's like if the if the world broadly is not uh, welcoming and open to who you are and how you want to express yourself. What little worlds can you carve out to, 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 to have that? I remember for me, the, the great, great importance of drawing. That was just a place where I could be with my own thoughts and I would be immersed in drawing for hours at a stretch as a little kid. Uh, and that was a really great place for me to be. It, was, it felt safe and it felt full of my expression. Uh, and that was a little world that I could control 
and, and enjoy. Um, and it was uh, something that, you know, you know, for parents, it's great because a kid locks himself up in a room and he's just face down drawing on the bench. That's hours of, of, of time that they don't have to be focused on <laughs> taking care of them or entertaining them or whatever. So, um, so I think it's that, like if, if the world writ large is, is hostile, can you find little places in the world that are not? Mm. Lana, um, I'm so sorry. I, I, I think as over the course of this whole hour, we neglected to say that, that Gordo is a lovely husky. Um, I don't know how you would say it. Chubby, chubby kid. Yeah, he is big. He's a fat uh, kid. Yeah. Yeah. And um, there's a question in the audience from C.E. Corngold, which is about what was the biggest impact on you, Jaime? Was it um, nature, nurture, or education? And thank you for this wonderful book. What was the biggest impact on me? Um, wow. Um, I feel like um, like it, that's such a, 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 a multi-part answer to that question. I, I, the, and the question, and I'm not trying to dodge it, is that it's all of the above. Um, it's the person I was born to be. It's the person I was taught to be. It's the person I untaught myself to be. Uh, all, all of that, the interplay of all of that felt like that feels like what was formative. Hmm. Well, that's a beautiful note to end on, Jaime. It's been such a pleasure talking to you, working on this book with you. I was actually Jaime's editor for this book was just an enormous joy um, watching it emerge and find all these readers. I think it's the beginning of a long life this book is gonna have. If you haven't read it yet, I cannot encourage you to pick it up more strongly. I think it's just an act of genius, big hearted, lovely, funny as hell. Um, and it will it will do probably what this hour did to you, which is make you smile and, and maybe have a little weep as well. <laughs> I know I've... <laughs> I've had that moment. Um, Jaime, thank you so much for giving up tonight and coming to talk to us. Yes. Um, and I, I don't know if the if the names of those artists got shared out, but just in case needed, people need to hear it, this uh, little painting is uh, Tony DiCarlo. Uh, the middle one is Orlando de la Garza, G-A-R-Z-A. Uh, and then the, the third one that I shared with you was Jamie Chavez of L.A. And uh, so thank you for asking. Uh, I, I, I support them and I, I love their work. And this is Robert Garcia, correct? Yes, that's Robert Garcia, another artist that I really enjoy. Yes. Yes, this is typical Jaime Cortez, basically True. doing something creative and then bringing five people along with, with him. <laughs> Robert somehow managed to draw, without ever meeting me, a little kid that looked an awful lot like me as a little kid. So I was, I really enjoyed that, that little drawing on the cover. Um, well, thank you, Jaime. I think uh, David or, uh, or Blaze or Beth is going to come back on and tell, tell you where to go now. I'm back. That was a fantastic conversation. Thanks to both of you. I, um, I love the book and I, 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 that conversation really illuminated a lot of, of, of what I felt about the book. So thank you for, uh, for that. Um, just a couple of closing notes before we, um, before we go out. Yeah. Again, big thanks to Jaime and John. Um, if you want to revisit this interview, it was recorded and will be available at CaliforniaBookClub.com. Um, next month's book is Maggie the Mechanic by Jaime Hernandez. So you'll want to um, come be back for that conversation. And a reminder again for the sale on Alta membership for California Book Club members. You can go to altaonline.com slash join slash join, uh, or again, the $3 digital uh, membership. Please participate in a two-minute survey that will pop up as soon as we end the event. And stay safe, stay well. Happy New Year. See you next. See you next month. See you next year. Thanks, everybody, for being here tonight.